Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to our Cyrophysical Systems course. And we are going through chapter three on the specifics of Cyrophysical Systems. And I wanted to um, rewind uh, a few slides from yesterday because I feel that I sort of rushed towards the end. So I wanted to uh, go back a few slides and start here. And we were talking about in the context of requirements of cyber physical systems, we were talking about the importance of reliability, robustness, and predictability. And that is something that is um, much better understood for hardware than for software. So the question is, how can we really measure the reliability and the predictability of software from a system level perspective. Because program languages, they're very good, the semantics of program languages are very good at expressing logic and functionality in, in the context of the logic, how you typed the program but they really have no semantics for taking into account the real-time behavior that the program is going to have to operate in. So how do we know exactly that our program is going to function in the real environment? I mean, we can tell, we can tell by looking at the flow of the code and the syntax that is going to be doing what we intended it to do 100% of the time from that code flow perspective. But even a simple program, you can see that and trace it and see that it's doing what you wanted it to do, but it could still fail from a real-time perspective when you put it into, into the system. So, and again, the, the reason is because programming languages don't, don't have a syntax, don't have the semantics to comprehend things like concurrency with other processes and real-time behavior. So in that sense, the abstraction mechanisms to express hardware as it interfaces with the physical world, as it interfaces with other hardware, and uh, as it is pa part of the system, a critical part of the system, the abstraction to do that is, is not there. So that is, uh, that is a requirement for cyber physical systems due to the complexity, but it's a requirement that is not necessarily uh, being met. And what I was saying last time is that in the same manner that hardware has had to adopt semantics <clears throat> and design flows and ways of coming up with functionality that are borrowed from software, like hardware description languages, uh, software is going to have to import some of the important ways of specifying things like concurrency and timing that are more natural of the hardware development wor world. So that, uh, that needs to happen. And then you end up with a homogeneous way of approaching the problem, whether it is hardware or software, you're just talking about logic, functionality, timing, concurrency, at a level, at, at, a, at a proper level of abstraction, where you are looking at the system and not worrying so much about what the functionality is going to be, whether it is hardware or software, because or a combination of both, because the abstraction is common for both uh, implementations. So if we look at a design flow <clears throat> for a system or a subsystem, 
we see something like this today that to make sure that we verify <clears throat> and analyze the requirements, the meeting of the requirements, we do that after implementation. So we implement and we verify. And when you are talking about complex, complex systems, that, that is a, a recipe for, for disaster. It really eats up uh, budget. It um, eats up deadlines. So really, execution suffers, um, which really is counterproductive to the business process. So this is uh, usually what we see, that we have some type of um, we have some type of platform that is selected, and we we do some high level design, then we do some low level design, and we implement, and then we try to design for worst case scenarios because those are easier to quantify than realistic scenarios. So we do some type of worst case timing analysis after implementation and a design an analysis for FED is done after implementation whether the system fits in larger system. And many times the answer at this point is no, so we have to go back. We have to go back sometimes all the way to the initial high level design. Notice that in this flow, there is no modeling involved. It's spec, design implementation, verification after implementation. And the execution of the development of the system gets caught up in these multiple loops. Sometimes going through the same loop multiple times, sometimes going through uh, any, any one of those loops. That is, that is where the disaster from an execution perspective comes in. And for simple systems, that works. You don't get caught up on the loops, but for complex systems, if you tackle them this way, the way that they're being tackled today, as we ramp up complexity of systems, is, is being difficult. 65% of projects are, are failing to, to meet budget and, and schedule. 65% of them. When these are companies that are dedicated to running surveys, and they basically run surveys of interesting questions, and then they sell the data in, um, in report formats to people that care about. For example, who would care about a question like that is someone that is trying to come up with a tool to, um, to alleviate this issue. So they can say, here's the data, we have this tool, this is what is going to benefit you. Or someone who has adopted the tool that wants to convince customers that we have these tools and we do this thing in a better way, so come work with us, consultants, in a sense. So uh, that, that's staggering, that, and it's not going to be working uh, forward. And we're going to talk some more about that when we talk about distributed teams, um, globalization that makes it just much more complex, this, this flow for complex systems. So what that means is that to develop cyber physical system, we need rigorous, rigorous discipline of systems and software engineering practices. And since we are interfacing with many different domains, we require analysis also in, the, in those domains, which is another reason and, and calls for, for modeling and abstraction. <clears throat> so how do we, in a uh, ad hoc way, if you will, manage different domains and, and try to organize 
all the different moving pieces that there may be, it, it really becomes a hard problem, almost an, an unmanageable problem, that coordination. And you end up with very high risk of failure. Failure in the sense of not meeting deadlines, running over budget, uh, and missing <clears throat> business opportunities. So, modeling simulation up front um, is one of the things that we are we are really selling uh, and and saying that this is what works. So how do we see the roles of uh, systems engineering and software engineering in developing cyber physical systems? What systems engineering can bring to the table is the discipline and the rigor of requirements analysis. There is an issue with complexity and trying to back annotate or shoehorn functionality late in the development cycle. The, disrupt, the, the level of disruptiveness that that brings because of the complexity of the system is much more than if you are trying to add something to a simple system. Because remember that a system, there is interdependence between all the components. So you try to add something new it's clear that it's going to be much more disruptive than if you just have a few simple things and you try to add a new feature or a new requirement. So when we say requirements analysis and the function of the composition, which are classic systems engineering activities, that becomes very important for cyber physical systems because that way you, you can never be sure that, or you can never say we won't change anything, and we don't want to be dogmatic, really. So it, it's a, there is a balance between being flexible, if something does need to be added, uh, and being dogmatic and say, well, this is it, and we're not changing it. That's not what we're saying. What we want is, through these activities, to enhance the likelihood or to optimize the likelihood that we have all the requirements up front. So good requirement analysis is, uh, is important. And the other activity that systems engineering can bring is design synthesis. Post functional decomposition, which is making sure that we have optimized all the support, all the functional support to meet all the requirements and the level of performance and the technical performance metrics that are needed for the product to be successful. So at this point, a very efficient architecture can emerge where, from which we can distill software and hardware partitioning and even physical partitioning as well. So tools like uh, parametric constraint evaluation and simulations and modeling in tools like uh, Simulink, MATLAB Simulink, those become important at that level. And then on the software engineering side, <clears throat> they're really the more sophisticated software engineering practices can bring the approach of software development as a design problem rather than a coding problem. <clears throat> the analysis of the problem, more formal analysis uh, of the problem, such as algorithm analysis, uh, simulation of algorithms before code implementation and optimization of algorithms at a higher level of abstraction than the actual software code. And then, of course, the, the implementation. So this is going to become very important. This is actually where most of the risk is, where most of the, um, where we lack 
the most uh, discipline when implementing complex systems. So clearly, when you start bringing systems engineering uh, and formal software engineering practices into something that has been largely sort of an electrical computer engineering pure field, and the fact that most schools don't teach things like systems engineering or, or these types of concepts makes it very difficult. Uh, to integrate. It really becomes then a multidisciplinary approach uh, to developing this, this complex systems and it becomes difficult to manage. So it's important to start integrating, integrating these practices in hardware development of complex systems to look at things from a system engineering perspective and appreciating the more advanced formal software engineering practices. When you layer uh, on over all that, the issue that you have uh, multiple or global teams, distributed teams, and things like that, <clears throat> it, become, it becomes even more important. When you start integrating hardware, software, and then communication networks, that also is another layer of com uh, complexity. But the good news is that if we do it right, this is deemed to be the next big thing, uh, literally, uh, from an information technology perspective. This is, uh, this is meant to be, and uh, remember, we talked about the Internet of Things as a paradigm and a support paradigm for cyber-physical systems, but cyber-physical systems are the products. Those are the products. And those are, and we'll go through some uh, examples, but those are the products that are really going to open terrific opportunities for business models, products, services, and is, is going to parallel the boom of the internet. The original, you know, the fact that you guys were not born, but the internet was not pervasive um, as it is right now. So people used to communicate and get into the network via the phone with modems. Uh, there wasn't a direct connection and when it came out, then it became the always on, it's always on, I don't have to dial into the internet. And it took off. So we're talking in the mid 90s, okay? So it's going to be that big. So it's important that we as, um, present and, and, you know, future engineers, if it's going to be big, that means that most of the opportunities are going to be there and you're going to participate. It's important to understand the issues. So, uh, how do we move on to that next step where we have the tools? Because if we're going to be working with tools to model and conceptualize, in a, in, in a sense, bring more uh, thought processes to the forefront before we just start doing something. And I'm, I'm a big fan of just thinking, thinking for a long time before doing anything and um, I think that that's, that's very productive when you deal with complexity. So if we're going to be using tools to do that job of thinking ahead and making sure that things don't fall through the cracks, um, 
we have to recognize that the frameworks are not so much readily available, but they are coming in pretty fast. Uh, as I mentioned, companies like uh, MathWorks, they're doing a good job integrating and bringing more systems engineering tools so we can uh, use them to do this task of conceptualizing and modeling before implementation. If you look at software engineering, and I know that um, perhaps this needs to be changed in the future, but here we have um, a distinction between computer engineering, which has a pretty good software development track. And we have electrical engineering that has very little software in it. Um, and maybe that needs to change in the future because if you look at the IEEE, which is essentially electrical and electronic um, engineering society, they have um, they have a guide to the software engineering body of knowledge, and they have identified what software engineers or people that develop software should know. So that's a, at least a guide uh, that has been there for a while. And of course, a ACM, which is the Association for Computing Machinery, which is more associated with software, they, they have also as well, and that's expected. But I like that IEEE also has something like that because it's a recognition that electrical and electronics uh, engineers need to know about software, formal software development practices, if they are doing something like that. And it's also a recognition that they can do it. Um, but perhaps, depending uh, on, on programs, how much of that you get. Uh, you can still, of course, learn and practice if you know, for example, what is the body of knowledge of software development uh, or software engineering. So this is important that we recognize that we no longer can really split things between hardware and software because we are creating another barrier. And um, all these products and systems are going to have vast amounts of, of, of both, of course. So what other essential features uh, cyber physical systems have. Number one, because of the complexity and the involvement of this system with human beings and also high value assets, safety is, um, is critical because of that involvement and interaction with the environment. So the neglect of safety from a requirements perspective can have catastrophic results. <clears throat> and because of that real-time nature, so because we can more easily verify or implement functionality than timing-related uh, requirements, the, those are the ones, the failure to react in a timely manner to the environment where the system is located, that is what is most likely to cause these catastrophic results. Because again, we don't have a good way of formally design it. It's sort of like try and then if not, do something else. So that's the loop, right? We don't have the semantics, the tools uh, to express those requirements. So that's number one, safety. But the system is still must perform. <clears throat> it, uh, it must perform and it must be, it must meet the functional requirements. 
So that's still important. And then the third one, which is a specific and new to a pervasive cyber-physical system, is interoperability. A standardization so we can connect things. Um, I just saw an article today about how the military, the DOD, has a new effort to really look at their standardization practices because this military systems are becoming very complex and it's taking too long and being too expensive to maintain them, to renew them without some level of, of a standardization. So that was, um, that was interesting because this is what we're saying. So interoperability is important in cyber-physical systems. So let's look at safety. What are ways of ensuring safety? A good way of ensuring safety is by modeling because you're not building anything. There is no, it's a model in a computer. You cannot get hurt. Worst thing, it doesn't work, or you do something and it crashes. The program crashes, that is. So, it's an obvious thing, but hey, you cannot get hurt by, by models. So you can prove a model. Uh, I mean, you can build a model. The other one is to use uh, what is called formal verification approaches, which is really try to um, come up with or express the system mathematically and then prove conditions that must be satisfied. That is very difficult. That is very difficult <clears throat> because of the complexity of the system. Now, modeling has its limitations. Again, we're not talking about, when we, when we talk about a model, we are assuming that it's understood that is a high fidelity model that really models the system. That also has its, its challenges. Um, that also has its challenges. And it's never going to be the real thing. But thinking about and trying to trade off how much effort you put into modeling, how to assess the quality of models, and balancing that with when do you actually build something that that is that that is part of that conceptual thought that needs to happen early on, and you end up doing you can end up doing some modeling uh, that is reasonable and it has uh, high fidelity or reasonable fidelity. So modeling is uh, is one way. The other one is certification based, which is a uh, process based mechanism where you show that you have followed the specific steps in the implementation that by proxy guarantee that safety has been designed in or built in throughout the construction or implementation of the design. And that, that can be done, but again, since you're building something and usually certification implies that you are giving it to a third party to actually verify that the safety is there is, is very expensive. It's very expensive. The person designing something is not the best person to test it because we cannot, we have a built-in bias. We don't want to break what we made. We, we want the answer to be, it works. So we are sort of benign with 
when you design something, we are benign with the way that we approach the testing. It's, it's just a psychological human nature bias that we cannot get away from. So third party is a, is a, uh, is a way, but it's very expensive. So next, on the topic of assuring performance and functionality of complex systems, what is emerging, and there are companies that have done a phenomenal job on coming up with very good software and hardware stacks where you have a basic platform a basic platform to start a design. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you want to, um, and maybe someone as part of the project can look into this, if you look at the Harmony infrastructure of hardware and software that Microchip has for their high end, MIPS based and ARM based uh, <clears throat> processors, 32-bit processors, is, um, is, is really good. It's really good and is impressive how much, um, how much software they have developed at the hardware support level, so the, the, the lowest layer in the stack that talks directly and supports directly the hardware. And then they have uh, good middleware. And then what you have to do is build on top of that your application specific uh, software. And then you can tap into that environment by using state machines or other types of data structures like pipes and you can use this infrastructure. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can come up with very complex systems uh, reasonably quickly. The idea is that that infrastructure has been tested and is being used by many people. So again, that helps with the, um, the reliability and predictability issue. So that's important to use those, uh, those uh, baseline platforms. And then what you can do and the challenge is how you integrate that beyond the domain of that embedded system and bring in the specifics of that interaction with the real world, with the physical world, and that interaction through the network. So that's one level up from that so specific software. That part, that's where we still need help. So next I wanna show you a tool uh, that is it's a, it's called a concept map. And it's used to conceptualize but well, it's used to conceptualize. In this case, it's conceptualizing cyber-physical systems, but you can see that it, it very nicely helps you start at the top of something and decompose it all the way to very fine levels of detail. And you can do that with a system, but in this picture, it's being done the concept of cyber physical systems is being used as an example to illustrate that um, that concept map because it's necessary too. I mean, we want to really look at cyber physical systems and look at all these um, details all the way down. So let's look at that. <coughs> So this is a concept map of cyber physical systems. And you can go back to the video and stop it there. 
Uh, we're not going to go through all the statements that you can get out of this, but these statements are characteristics. They could be requirements. Uh, if you're talking about an actual system, a product. So it's a good, uh, it's a good tool. So again, you can go back to the video and stop it in this, uh, you know, look for this uh, frame and stop it there and look at everything. Or you can wait for the slides later on in a few days and look at it. But the idea is that you can conceptualize things and you can come up with semantics and statements or requirements or characteristics and attributes of a system all the way down to uh, as, as granular a level as, as you want. So we can start with, uh, for example, cyber physical systems are control systems. And then we have this semantics that join all the things. We can go, again, cyber physical systems are control systems, possibly with human in the loop. So that's, that's a characteristic. Again, you could use that to make requirements and decompose them. Because then you have all these fine levels that you can say, did we hit that one? Did we hit that one? And you know, each node becomes something that you have to check. And it helps you with tests as well. Or we could have at the bottom, for example, um, well, let's, let's take the, the one in the middle. You could say some physical system required improved design tools that enable design methodology that supports scalability and complexity management through modularity and composability or through synthesis or through interfacing with legacy systems. So uh, there are many, of course, many paths in this graph. So again, you can go back to that, but um, it is an interesting concept map that the size cyber physical systems .org put together and, um, and we're sharing that. Not only because it's interesting, but because it's important as well. It gives you a lot of characteristics of a cyber-physical system. So what we know so far is that, is that the bringing to life of cyber-physical systems can be allocated as an engineering discipline we know it's focused on technology. And if we're going to be modeling and using a state abstraction, that is based on a way of doing mathematical abstractions. And it involves, it involves timing, real-time constraints, and concurrency. So, in contrast, and a challenge is that the people that are coming from the pure computer science towards software engineering, as a path towards uh, software engineering, computer science really abstracts away anything that has to do with timing. It's all about functionality and algorithmic correctness, but there is not re a real treatment or formal treatment of timing from a pure comp computer science perspective. So the hardware people are more in tune to that, even if you're just doing the well-known embedded systems. So this, this, um, this difference must be bridge as well, because the systems are dynamic. So you need to take that into consideration. 
the environment around that is changing, and that makes the system dynamic because the environment is part of the system. So just uh, to share that people are really looking at this, taking it seriously uh, as, a, as an issue, and there are some research efforts, um, mainly in, the, so for example, UC Berkeley has uh, several, several projects that are trying to address the issue of complex, complex systems that are embedded in nature and have a good amount of complex software in them. So that's just some of them there. Um, and there are also some products that have emerged. A lot of them are open source that have come from university efforts that can be used to enhance and bring a little bit more of higher level modeling to the, the, the software development. So Ptolemy, Ptolemy is uh, one, uh, one such effort that actually is um, probably the, the, the best known uh, for, this type of, uh, for this type of activity. So the issue of how to look at real-time issues from a, from a software development perspective is, is an area of research because there is a gap there, as I mentioned. So now we're going to start talking about cyber physical systems applications. Throughout, we're going to keep coming back to the issues of modeling and the, methodolo uh, the methodology of hardware software partitioning and hardware uh, software co-design. But let's start really uh, looking at some <coughs> some applications or application domains. So I have a list there. You can read that. But perhaps the the one that is most in front of us is the um, advanced um, advanced vehicle systems. So. Just a couple of weeks ago, the big technological uh, automobile conference uh, took place in California. So a couple of observations. It's amazing that it's not, it's not taking place in Detroit. It's happening in California, where it's really more about IT and high tech and advanced technologies. And one of the things that Sort of a strong theme of that event is that looking at the car as sort of like the next consumer electronics device. So try to you know think about that. What that is inferring is that the car is really going to be more of an electronics device than a mechanical one. Uh, and probably most people think about mechanics when it comes to, to cars, but the amount of electronics and the complexity of electronics is going to really um, dwarf anything that has to do with the mechanics of it. Or you still will, have, will need some type of drivetrain and an enclosure, but what the complexity is going to be to provide more safety, more comfort, and better quality of life is going to be in the electronics. So we want to start by talking a little bit about advanced autom automotive systems. And in that sense, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about autonomous uh, vehicles.
So uh, even before, in, in the early um, 2000s, even before the urban challenge emerged, there was a um, like an off-road challenge that actually got solved pretty quickly. So it was like a hundred miles in 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 a Nevada desert, and um, making sure that a car could go by itself all that trajectory. And because it was in the desert, so it got it got done very very quickly. Um, I think that Stanford um, is the one that won. So this effort. Uh, <clears throat> DARPA was the one um, that came up with that, and they had, I think, the uh, they call it the DARPA Grand Challenge at that point, and I think they had a price of like a hundred thousand dollars or something uh, like that. And DARPA is a, an arm of DOD, which uh, stands for Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So they try to. F from DOD budget, that is the agency that tries to fund advanced research that they see may have an application to defense systems. And autonomous vehicles is being in that list for, for, a, long, for a long time. So just like, you know, we talked about NSF being funded by Congress directly and they manage research and they fund research uh, they fund more of a broader research. It could be for all kinds of causes. It doesn't have to be a specific uh, to a theme of defense. But so DARPA is kind of like the NSF of the DOD. Is there agency to fund with DOD budget research on technologies that they deem important to advance the state of the art of defense systems? So the off-road challenge was solved relatively quickly, uh, like in a couple of years. And then they, uh, they said, well, now we're going to have an urban challenge, which is much more complex, because now you are in an urban setting. So that, um, that started in 2007. And just to give you an idea, of what such a car looks like, which is really a superset of what the off-road cars have to have. They, they all have to have the same type of uh, technologies. But this is the, um, the Ohio State University entry into the Urban Challenge. And you can see what, uh, so let's, let's look about uh, what type of technologies they have in there. So you have laser rangefinder. So this is basically a way to be able to assess distance of objects in front of you with lasers. So essentially this equipment has rotating lasers uh, and you sense the light that gets reflected back and then you can tell the distance, first the presence, if you do get something back, there is something out there, and then by looking at the time of flight, you can assess the distance. Now notice that this has also multiple systems that address the same thing uh, with different levels of granularity and performance. So you also have radar, radar systems, uh, you have um, <clears throat> GPS for navigation, so that's that's understood, and uh, you have image processing systems. So there are mainly two things. How in 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 in, a, in an autonomous vehicle, there are mainly two things: knowing where you are. So you can go where you're going. So there is navigation. And then the next thing is just making sure that you don't bump into anything. That you, I mean, at a very simple level, that's what you're trying to do. 
So things like GPS is important, but then things like radars, lasers, which is the light version of it, like the range, uh, the, the laser rangefinder, and image processing, they are all there to try to make up if you have a way forward that is clear. And they have different capabilities. Okay? For example, image processing cannot really tell how far things are, not easily. Uh, and if something is, if there is an obstruction, uh, necessarily, but they're very good at picking up a good amount of detail. So it, it can tell if there is something in front, but it's harder to be able to tell if it's something laying down or something standing up. To make that 3D in image processing is, is more challenging. So radars are good at just saying there is something out there and it's this far away, but it cannot tell you what it is. So image processing can do that. So these systems are complementary, okay? And here you can see that Ohio State University was using a mobile eye image processing systems, or uh, a mobile eye image processing system. So at that time, mobile eye, a company from Israel. So you know who bought that company recently for $15 billion? Intel. Intel bought mobile eye recently, I think in 2015 or 17, for $15 billion. Because, you know, the processors, where are they going to put those processors in the future? If PCs are not growing, they're gonna, they want to put them in this system, this image processing systems. And they want to fend off competition from people like NVIDIA. So, so that was the Ohio State University uh, vehicle. And these are uh, some of the rules of that challenge, the urban challenge. A lot more there than for the off-road one. So, Safety was a, a big part of it, so the vehicle could not hit things. Uh, it had to actually obey all the all the um, the driving laws, the same laws that any human would have to obey: obey stop signs, yields, traffic lights, uh, speed limits. So everything that Anybody would have to obey, the car had to be able to uh, obey. It had to be entirely autonomous, so completely autonomous, no interference from any type of um, outside agent. And then the route inside this urban area would only be applied, uh, provided, 24 hours before the race starts. So why did they do that? So whoever designed this car had to have a high level of adaptability to whatever route was thrown at it. So in a sense, it could not know a priori what the route was because then you could actually tune the system to the route. And that's a much easier problem to solve if you know what you're going to be doing than if you have to, if you don't know. You just have to know how to react to the specifics of a new route. So they will have to go through the route and a specific waypoints and the waypoints so the route is one thing, but then how to approach the waypoints along the route, that only was to be provided five minutes before the race starts. 
So again, that was to foster the designers to make sure that they built in adaptability in the system. Another rule, a real-time constraint, the car can only stop and think about, about it for 10 seconds. So they had to, that, that's a real-time constraint. Whatever algorithm, whatever solution was being computed, it had to be done in less than 10 seconds. And it also had to have some redundancy on ways to deal with some adversity because it had to be able to operate in rain, uh, fog, and with the GPS blocked. So in, in the case that you were going to say through a tunnel, or if you are driving within an urban environment with tall buildings, which you don't get GPS visibility necessarily. So you had to do all that. And of course, you had to avoid collisions, so that's important. Um, and it also had to go into uh, parking spaces or parking uh, areas. I don't know if it actually had to parallel park or not, but um, but it did have to go be able to go into parking lots and be able to park and make U-turns. So back out and all that. So pretty sophisticated set of rules and comprehensive. And um, this was done. This was done. <laughs> so 11 teams uh, in the final event. And CMU and the GM uh, vehicle won the competition, reporting only um, limited problems. I don't know what those are. But they were able to uh, navigate and finish out of the 11 teams that started. So the technology is there. The question is, now, how does it really become pervasive, right? And that, to, to make it that way, you need more, more complexity. And how does it really plug into the overall environment? So this, this is still a very little interaction with the environment. I'm sure that there were not, like, people walking around, you know, they sort of, <clears throat> it was a specific course. There were, there were no people uh, walking around uh, like in normal urban areas. So it was still a little bit of a special case. So how do you make this pervasive? Uh, it needs it spells more complexity, how you plug it into the actual environment, the natural environment, the physical environment with humans. And how do you make it that is reasonably cost because all this, you know, there are 11, 11 cars because not everybody could afford to even start looking at getting into this type of competitions. You know, these cars were really expensive, okay? Way off from, you know, the price tags of luxury models. So it's still not something that you can actually commercialize, but it was to demonstrate that, that the possibility and the, pol the potential of the technologies and these uh, type of systems. So it certainly, it certainly caught um, caught people's attention. So this is the list of the um, different technologies in the GM bus vehicle. You can see the um, characteristics. Uh, the systems and the characteristics. <clears throat> so GPS, uh, GPS, and also LiDAR. So that's your your light um, detection and ranging. 
system just like like a radar, but instead of using radio waves, it's using light. Same same principle. They both have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, sometimes you want to use light, sometimes you want to use radio frequencies. For example, depending on the band, you can get better visibility with radio than with light. Definitely, if, it's, if the environment is very foggy and <clears throat> then light is not going to work. But when you have no obstruction and it's clear, uh, when you have a clear line of sight, light is much more effective than, than um, and easier to use than radar. So just for your information, that's some of the, uh, the technologies and equipment that the GM vehicle had, although it's kind of uh, cryptic, really. So this is a, a blood diagram, sort of a state chart of an autonomous vehicle. And this is here because I wanted to point out and try to relate it to what we talked about regarding a state variable modeling uh, of systems. So notice that these boxes are this box is here or this box is a state estimator. So this is a state type of uh, a state design and then you have different sections for example goal selection and the goal may be to stay in the lane, or the goal may be to take a turn, because you calculated that to make your route most efficiently, you have to make a turn. Uh, so, and I, this is just a section of something like this, but let's say that you are to stay in the in the in the lane. So. You can go into that section. Now, part of uh, staying in the lane is that you may have to merge into another lane if you're not making a turn. So you can plan to merge. You can be checking that you're keeping your distance from other vehicles. And you ultimately have to drive the vehicle. Uh, to make sure that the directionality is consistent, that the speed is uh, adequate. To do that, you can get inputs from a scene reporter, which clearly would be like an image processing type of subsystem. So all that's involved in, let's say, lane straight driving. But let's say that you have to you're at an intersection, and you have to manage and handle that interception. It may be that you have to turn. It may be that you have to keep going. So you can have other activities associated with that. So you get the idea. The point is that people are using the same concepts that we are talking about of a state variable approach and a state chart approach to these complex systems. So there's a real application of this. Is, 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 these are real useful tools. So the urban challenge 
was successful and one little company uh, company took notice said we we also want to you know play with autonomous vehicles and in 2010 google announced the their autonomous uh, car based on a toyota prius and they still have it and they have it they drive it in nevada and california and so far that car has driven more than a million miles without any incident they use that car as a test bed for studying and testing algorithms and developing the technology so since then of course uh google has reorganized and they do have an arm an actual company of the whole conglomerate uh, devoted to autonomous vehicles which is called waymo probably know. Uh, so they are you know this this car is equipped with the same type of technology like i said the hardware is not changing that much the specific performance of this hardware components may get better but the type of hardware that's not likely to change you need to be able to tell where you are so you can know where you're going you need to be able to see via image processing or radar or later and you need to be able to drive to to actuate what makes the vehicle move turn go stop brake in a safe manner keeping distance keeping keeping a speed so that's another effort and as a um, I guess a, a bit of trivia is that the only accident that the car had is when actually someone drove it by hand so um, in 2011 so even even though there is a, a big interest in this because it's seen as a as something that can bring real quality of life to a lot of things we're still a long way from actually having something that is totally commercialized i think that tesla may be the um, the company that is closest to having something and i'll talk a little bit about that later on but we're still uh well it's also been reported that companies like uber are developing um uh, autonomous vehicles so in that case then instead of uh uber drivers you know there would be uber cars and they'll be autonomous there is there are a lot of efforts but we're still a long way to make something that is affordable that is safe and that can really be immersed in the physical environment where we are there too and that we basically feel safe uh, because we all have the ultimate say through our you know our regulatory processes whether this is going to coexist freely with us these types of machines so tesla what they are shooting for are cars that and this is a nice approach instead of saying we're going to have autonomous vehicles they're they're saying well we want something that is 90 percent of the time is is autonomous so when it gets really tricky the human is going to handle it but really uh 90 percent of the time is pretty repetitive and routine this activity of driving so why not have that as the goal with uh, a very sophisticated sort of cruise control system not the one that we normally use but this would be a sort of souped up cruise control system that is not just keeping the speed constant uh, according to the setting but also is going to have more feedback rather than just the actual speed where the control system is dealing just with 
friction and slope and things like that. This one will have radar to deal with obstruction and get some visibility and uh, more sophisticated computing entities to handle those more sophisticated algorithms. So it's a good, um, and also be, be safe to be able to drop off that, let's say, autopilot mode uh, in a safe manner so that there are no catastrophic consequences if something goes, goes, uh, goes wrong. So this is a nice effort uh, from, from Tesla. So if we think about these vehicles that to make all this autonomy possible, perhaps it's going to be aided by receiving data and plugging itself into the network, into the network um, as it exists via 5G, for example, the same network that we would use for our cell phones. They can get into the network to get actual uh, better performance, better functionality. So now the cars are connected. And so, Cybersecurity is, is a concern. And actually, the Infinity Q50 has an option that you can drive it remotely. Um, so, uh, so cybersecurity starts being a real concern. And I think there are some uh, companies, the way that they try to test the resilience of these systems is actually to give money or a price to people, to incentivize people to try to break in or hack it, and then they give a price. So actually, uh, there are efforts like that in the um, in, uh, advanced automobile security systems. So you can see that uh, certainly we have a lot of technology available to make um, cyber physical systems with application in very sophisticated vehicles. Uh, and another, another area of application is in, in power. So usually, if you want to make a big impact, you go for big problems, such as transportation, that are tied to infrastructure. Transportation, power, uh, energy is another one. So energy is another uh, area where fire uh, physical systems can bring a lot to enhance the quality of life of society. So, uh, not just in the area of modeling of power systems, but also when it comes to tying better all the assets that make a power system, which are high value assets. So we'll get back to the power, but now let's talk about communication because Communication becomes, it's really, we can have applications of, of cyber physical systems in communication, but that's going to make the communication paradigms more, uh, it's, going, it's going to make the communication, where you have all distributed assets of generation, distribution, and control. So communication becomes uh, more important. So let's take a look at that. In that case, uh, Three areas, machine to machine communication, wireless sensor networks, and wireless body area networks. So those are three areas of research that are closely related or are going to aid in the deployment of cyber physical systems. So what is machine to machine communication. 
That refers to how do we set up infrastructures, algorithms, and, and systems where machines kind of uh, negotiate and talk to each other, not just from a receiver, transmitter perspective, or a client server type perspective, but really from a peer to peer, and they can decide among themselves what to do. That's what we're talking about, machine to machine communication. So if machines could do that without having to wait for the human in the loop, that would make him much more efficient. And the things that could be implemented using that approach could really be, I think, could be, um, could be amazing. So that's one, one area. Then we can envision, in that sense, the wireless sensor networks, because that's going to be key for things like um, things like um, <clears throat> power uh, power grid, making the power grid uh, smarter. So all these things are related. There is no, these are not isolated. There is a Venn diagram of all these different technologies, and they are related. They are, um, they overlap each other, as well as the body area network. That still, that still can be considered a wireless sensor network. So all that in communication, the advances in communication is what is going to help and really provide that paradigm that I dis started discussing last time of how that Internet of Things that we hear about is really a paradigm to enable these uh, cyber physical systems. So you can envision many things uh, to enhance quality of life in healthcare, uh, smart homes, smart grids, assisted living uh, for people who, who need that. Uh, many opportunities to in make life better start to emerge. Just remember that they are complex and they need to be developed right on time, on budget, and carefully, thus. So let me, uh, let me stop here and we'll pick up consumer uh, related applications of cyber physical systems uh, next time on Monday. All right, have a good weekend.